In November 2013, then-President Viktor Yanukovych at the last moment refused to sign the so-called association agreement with the EU and set Ukraine on a course towards Russia instead. The decision sparked protests across the country, fueled by growing discontent with the ruling elite. What started out as a simple but large-scale expression of discontent would soon balloon into a massive pro-European movement against Russian influence and government corruption. The protest's epicenter was Independence Square in Kiev, also known as Maidan Nezaleznosti, where the name Maidan Revolution came from. The protests went on for months until people are saying that there's a sniper on a building overlooking the Institute Sky Street behind me. So th those are live ammunition rounds. Kalashnikov, where bullets have gone through their shields. We're not exactly sure which building the sniper is in, but so any of us here could get hit. We're here in front of Hotel Ukraina that overlooks Independence Square. Only when clashes began, it started being used as a triage centre for the wounded. Apparently inside there are a number of dead bodies, and mostly from gunshot wounds. On the 19th of February 2014, police opened fire on protesters with live ammunition, killing dozens. How did we get here? How does a European country in the 21st century go from pro-European protests to police opening fire? The answer can be found in Ukraine's recent political history. In 2004, Viktor Yanukovych won the presidential election against his pro-European opponent, Viktor Yushchenko. The election was considered massively fraudulent both domestically and internationally, having been rife with voter intimidation, voter suppression, and massive corruption. This resulted in the so-called Orange Revolution, a peaceful protest movement that was successful in the end, having achieved an election rerun. There, Yushchenko beat Yanukovych by an 8% margin and became president of Ukraine. In the next election, however, in 2010, Yanukovych made a comeback by a thin margin, after which he imprisoned his main pro-Western opponent, Yulia Tymoshenko. The trial was of course a complete farce. Tymoshenko was a political prisoner. But the election once again exposed the massive divide inside Ukraine between pro-Western and pro-Russian regions, the pro-Western heartland being the areas around Lviv, while the pro-Russian the areas around Donetsk. The reason for the party of regions' popularity was in large part them favoring devolution of power to the regions and more autonomy for minorities, linguistic or ethnic. Now the areas in the south and east are mostly Russian-speaking and are closer to Russia culturally. There is of course nothing wrong with wanting to give minorities more autonomy. The problems start when the Russian government uses these minorities first as a Trojan horse and then a bettering ram in service of their geopolitical interests. And make no mistake, Russia was not going to let Ukraine move towards the west. They were to remain firmly in Russian orbit and Yanukovych was the guarantee for that. But alas, there was a small problem. Most people supported European integration over moving towards Russia. In the minds of many Ukrainians, Russia represented oppression, poverty, corruption, and the occasional genocide. And thus, during the protests, statues of Lenin became targets as the perceived symbols of the Russian world, just like the King George statues during the American War for Independence. But the will of the people never stopped a Russian or pro-Russian government from doing what they want anyway, and so Yanukovych held fast despite growing discontent. And his tactics to quell the protests were rather colourful. At one point, his Prime Minister started fearmongering about how the EU Association Agreement would mean that Ukraine has to legalise same-sex marriage, which, you know, okay. Otherwise, a choice method of intimidation was the use of so-called titushki. These were violent thugs in civilian clothing, paid by the government to do their dirty work. They blend into protests to instigate violence, beat up protesters, and occasionally murder journalists. But this, and the increasingly brutal police actions, did little to calm the protests. In fact, as pressure from the government mounted, people held together even more firmly. It was amazing to see how these events galvanized Ukrainian society. Previously, there was barely any national unity or cohesion, only people commiserating on the ruins of the Soviet Empire. But through the protests, Ukrainians had shown unprecedented willingness to cooperate and self-organize. It was this bittersweet moment when they had to make a stand against their own government that was only getting more violent as time went on. With the fate of the protesters uncertain and Kiev abuzz with numerous reports of activists being abducted, we headed to meet Euromaidan SOS. So we have started this initiative on the 30th of November. We want to help with the legal aid, but unfortunately we started to do almost everything. Your purpose is to help any, who might yes. be any legal trouble, or if they've been injured, or if, if they go missing. Yes. This is our workshop, uh, making shoes and some armor. And what did you do before the revolution? My job, I am the organizer of uh, some events. The protesters' energy, however, was not infinite. By the 19th of February 2014, as the events dragged on for the third month, the protests briefly ran out of steam. People were exhausted and supplies were depleted. Of course, the government was aware of this. And so on the same day, they were about to launch their final assault on the Maidan. They had to move fast. More protesters were on their way to Kiev and risked giving the movement new momentum. Here's how one of the protesters described the moments before the government ambush. 
At about 5 o'clock in the morning, the situation was getting desperate. Our lines had been pushed back. The barricades on Prodisnaya Street and on Kreschatik were left unmanned. The others kept asking what we should do when the Berkut launches the offensive. We agreed that we would keep fighting. Yes, wives, children and parents are waiting for us all at home, a man of about 60 sighed. But since we're here, we have to hold out till the end, come what may. There is nothing worse than waiting for danger to come and knowing you're helpless against it. The others started calling their relatives. I won't be able to talk for long, my fellow countryman said on the phone. I'm alright, don't tell Masha I called, but if you can't reach me in a few hours, tell my wife I love her very much. I took out my phone too. My wife and three sons were waiting for me at home. I wanted to call them and tell them something, but there was a lump in my throat. It's starting, our friend Vasya shouted suddenly. They're coming, looks like... Titushke. Turning around, I saw a hundred people approaching with shields and bats. On our side, there were no more than twenty of us left. The men walked briskly and confidently. I was about to start flinging stones at them, when, for some reason, the strangers stopped about fifteen meters away from us. They are with us, I heard Vasya shout. Brothers, one of them said. We're sorry we took so long. They were the Lviv Hundred. They told us how the police tried to stop them from reaching Kiev. They were stopped several times on the Zhitomir Highway, but they were able to break through the police lines and continue on. The appearance of the group that later came to be known as the Lviv Hundred was one of those right place at the right time type situations. With their help, the remaining protesters managed to mend the barricades in adequate numbers. However, little did they know that the government had at this point decided to change strategy, evident from the strange, loud bangs that could be heard shortly after. Because of the smoke, I couldn't see what was happening. Suddenly, a man fell down at my feet. I had already seen him somewhere before. Must have lost consciousness, I thought. And, as I was about to give him a slap to wake him, I saw a hole in his temple. Blood seeped from the wound. The guy was shot. A second later, another one fell nearby. One of the Lviv hundred shot dead. Dragging further casualties into the hotel lobby, I could barely comprehend what was happening. Everything was like a nightmare. I will forever remember a tall, black-haired man of about 60 entering the hotel. I saw him among the Lviv hundred, together with a guy very similar to him. They were father and son. They fought, as they say, shoulder to shoulder. But this time, the man came alone. One by one, he began to lift the sheets that covered the dead. Seeing the face of one of them, he stopped. He knelt down and took off his helmet, hands trembling. The doctors tried to pull him aside, but the man wouldn't budge. He just found the body of his son. In the end, their sacrifice, along with everyone else's, was not in vain. The murder of protesters was only fuel to the fire, and the movement rebounded with new momentum. Following days of desperate stalemate, Viktor Yanukovych fled the country, assisted by Russian Spetsnaz. The revolutionaries won. The party of regions disbanded. A caretaker government was installed, and a new presidential election was scheduled for the 25th of May. With the president gone, people found his villa deserted and unguarded. Word spread like wildfire, and soon enough, massive crowds started showing up to behold the insane luxury and lavishness of Viktor Yanukovych's now former lifestyle. This is the main office of Yanukovych. Wow, pretty grand. You guys are working for 200 euros a month and your president lives in a place like this. How does that make you feel? You saw it. Yeah. You're my done. People's self-defense at some point will give Mershagiria to the state. Okay. Because it belongs to people. And we hope this will be the first in the world museum in a uh, museum of corruption. And they actually did. The Mershagiria Residence Museum to this day is open for visitors. But the revolutionaries had little time to celebrate their victory. On the 27th of February, unmarked, heavily armed soldiers began seizing government buildings in Crimea. They came to be known as Little Green Men, sporting high-end Russian military gear. On the 1st of March, Putin requested and received official approval from himself, basically, to deploy Russian troops to Ukraine. That was, of course, a formality, since at that point Crimea was effectively under complete Russian control. Two weeks later, a referendum was organized, where people could decide whether Crimea should become part of Russia. The two choices were yes and yes. And how did that happen? Option number one was, do you support joining Crimea with the Russian Federation as a subject of the Russian Federation? Pretty straightforward. However, option number two was the following. Do you support the restoration of the 1992 Crimean constitution and Crimea status as a part of Ukraine? The problem is the 1992 constitution declares Crimea as an independent state. So yeah, we can all see what they did there. In the end, it didn't matter much, since according to the results, 95.5% voted for joining Russia with an official turnout of 85%. 
50%. However, the real turnout was around 40%, with 50-60% of people voting for joining Russia. How do we know that? Because the Russian President's Human Rights Council accidentally posted the real statistics, which they then quickly deleted, but not before people took notice. The propaganda surrounding the referendum was part of the Russian narrative of heroic anti-fascism. More on that later. The referendum was, of course, a complete farce, and there was no question where Crimea would end up eventually. It remains to this day under Russian control, in violation of the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, which Russia agreed to, stating, among other things, that Russia cannot use force against Ukraine and has to respect its independence and sovereign borders. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov later lied about this, saying how the memorandum only said not to attack Ukraine with nukes. But after literally five seconds of googling, you can find that the memorandum actually had six points, half of which Russia is openly violating. But at that point, Russia didn't even pretend to care about international agreements. Crimea was firmly in their hands, boosting Vladimir Putin's approval rating from a historic low of 62% to a six-year high of 85.9%. But just as the Crimean crisis came to an end, a whole new series of crises started emerging. Pro-Russian protests spread across the east and south, the largest ones in Donetsk and Luhansk. Their locations mostly corresponded to areas where Yanukovych's now former party had the most support. Pro-Ukrainian counter-protests followed, usually outnumbering the former. The epicenters of the pro-Russian movements were Kharkiv, Odessa, Donetsk and Luhansk. Their actions had varying degrees of success. In Kharkiv, protesters stormed the city theater first after mistaking it for city hall. Afterwards, they occupied the regional state administration building and proclaimed the Kharkiv People's Republic. Later that day, Ukrainian special forces kicked them out of the building, which marked the end of the republic and also the local protests. In Odessa, pro-Russian protesters didn't actually want to become part of Russia, rather an autonomous region within Ukraine. Clashes between pro-Russians and pro-Ukrainians culminated at the trade union's house, where the latter group encircled the former. Outnumbered, the pro-Russians fled inside the building and started throwing rocks and Molotov cocktails from the roof. The pro-Ukrainian protesters responded similarly with Molotov cocktails. Long story short, the building caught fire, killing 43. That was more or less the end of the pro-Russian protests in the region. Donetsk and Luhansk were a different story, however. There, the Russian influence was the strongest, and locals had legitimate grievances against the previous Ukrainian governments. These are mostly under funneling money out of the region, and so on. Protesters and later armed insurgents occupied most government buildings in Donetsk and Luhansk, quickly spreading west. To contain them, on the 9th of April 2014, the so-called anti-terrorist operation was launched by the Ukrainian government. However, two major factors played against them. First off, the Ukrainian army was in complete shambles. At the start of the conflict, they had around 3,000 deployable troops with obsolete, often non-existent gear. They had to be propped up by volunteers, donations, and foreign aid. The second problem was the locals, who were in the east in many cases staunchly pro-Russian. There were many cases of them simply blocking the Ukrainian army and forcing them to surrender their weapons and equipment. With low morale and uncertain allegiances, many units complied. Other units, often composed of motivated volunteers, were actually pushing back against the pro-Russian insurgents. This included far-right ultra-nationalist militias as well, to nobody's surprise. At this point, fighting was concentrated around government buildings inside cities. As the skirmishes continued, a referendum was held on the 11th of May in the separatist-controlled territory similar to the one in Crimea. If official results are to be believed, 89% voted for seceding from Ukraine. As a relevant side note, at that point the separatists were led by Igor Girkin, a Russian veteran and former FSB officer, who, a day after the referendum, declared himself supreme commander of the Donetsk People's Republic. He called for the destruction of all Ukrainian military units in the area and requested Russian military intervention against the quote-unquote impending NATO invasion and genocide. Now earlier I've mentioned the Russian narrative of separatists being heroic anti fascist warriors. This idea is a cornerstone of Russian propaganda, painting the Ukrainian government as basically Nazis, thus establishing some half-baked parallel with Soviet troops fighting actual Nazis during World War II. Over here in reality, though, things are a bit different. Of course, pro-Ukrainian far-right elements were also present during the revolution, such as the right sector. However, at no point were they in control of the country, and they remain on the fringes to this day. On top of that, Ukraine's current president, Volodymyr Zelensky, who won a landslide victory in 2019, is a Russian native speaker and Jewish so it's not exactly the Fourth Reich over there. To the Russians worried about the Ukrainian Nazis, I can tell the same thing I would tell Americans worried about Islamists. If you don't want to risk extremists gaining power and prominence, don't invade their countries. That tends to galvanize them. But how does this Russia the brave anti-fascist warrior narrative hold up to scrutiny? Oh boy. Here's Putin in 2018 in Austria, dropping by the wedding of the far-right FPÖ party's foreign minister, Karin Kneissel. This whole event was just bizarre, to say the least. <laughs> 
This is Heinz Christian Strache, the former chief of the far right party, who was forced to resign in 2019 due to the so called Ibiza scandal, where he promised the supposed needs of a Russian oligarch lucrative construction projects. In exchange, the Russians were to take over Kronenzeitung, Austria's biggest newspaper, a major force in swaying voters, and turn it into a pro FPÖ outlet. But the oligarch's quote unquote niece turned out to be an undercover journalist, and the whole conversation was recorded. Also, here's Heinz Christian Strache in 2009 protesting the opening of an Islamic cultural center in Vienna. I'm sorry, this photo was just too funny not to include. In France, Marine Le Pen's far right party was financed by a Russian bank. Also, here she is in 2017, having been invited to the Kremlin by Putin, where she talked about the need for friendship and cooperation with Russia and how sanctions are the answer, and so on. And here's Eric Zemmour, France's new far right figurehead, recently found guilty of inciting hatred and racial abuse, having called unaccompanied migrant children thieves, murderers, and rapists. About Putin, he had this to say Putin has restored the state, stepped in as the last defender of the Christians of the East, he exalts the Russian character of the country, defends national sovereignty, the family, and the Orthodox religion. Zemmour's presidential bid now has Russian backing, by the way. How about the German far right party, the IFD? Yep, they're getting invitations to Moscow, aside from other worrying connections. And let's not forget about Viktor Orban, one of the most pro Russian politicians in the EU. Now, I don't mean to sound negative or anything, but Orban is an ethno nationalist, and he kind of made the Jewish question part of his campaign in the form of a billboard campaign against the so called Soros plan, which, according to Orban, is a plan by George Soros and his shadowy elite to flood Europe with brown people, thus committing white genocide. This line of rhetoric is not alien to our friends at Russia Today either. I could go on for a while about other far right parties in Europe and all their ties to Russia, but then this video would be 12 hours long. But you get the point. Why does heroic anti fascist Russia seem to have such bizarre connections to virtually every European far right movement? It's almost like this modern Russian anti fascism is complete bullshit. Almost. But back to Ukraine, this Real Clear Politics article details all the separatist figureheads' murky ties to a number of Russian far right movements. I suggest you give it a read, it's very eye opening. My favorite part of the article is this. While the infamous Donetsk leaflet ordering Jews to register and pay a special fee to the separatist government was almost certainly a hoax, Russian political scientist Anton Shekovtsov points out that there have been real and numerous manifestations of anti Semitism in the anti Maidan movement in southeastern Ukraine. Among them, street posters, internet posts, and even speeches at rallies attacking the new. Kiev government as a Jewish clique seeking to use Ukrainians to defend the interests of wealthy Jews or depicting the Maidan revolution as a Zionist coup. The Euro-Asian Jewish Congress notes that when pro-Russian separatists seized control of the television station in Slavyansk on April 17th, their introductory broadcast was a video bearing the logo and web address of the rapidly anti-Semitic popular liberation movement and promising that their broadcasting would be a counter-attack against the quote-unquote Zionist zombie box. The article also talks about the Russian Cossack militiamen who fought with the separatists whose goal, according to one of its leaders, is to destroy the Jew Masons who are fomenting disorder all over the world and causing us, the common Orthodox Christian folk, to suffer. The article goes on, another Cossack in Slavyansk told the Guardian's Luke Harding that Russians and Ukrainians were one people before Jews like Trotsky divided us. And the reason why all these far-right weirdos have such a presence among separatists is because fundamentally both Crimea and the Donbass are nationalistic projects aiming to restore some mythical past greatness of Russia. You know, Umberto Eco style. At this point, we need to talk a bit about Russia's geopolitical goals and plans going into the Ukrainian conflict. The goal was simple, to keep Ukraine firmly in Russian orbit as a geopolitically important buffer state. Plan A was to keep Yanukovych in power, thus cementing Russian influence for good. That of course didn't work, the protests were much more intense than anyone had expected. Plan B was to fuel the pro-Russian protest movements after Maidan, let the country collapse into chaos, and then simply take over. But that didn't work either because of what the Maidan produced, which Putin would never have expected, the revival of a Ukrainian national identity that held most of the country together. Plan C was then to escalate the conflict into an armed insurgency and take over the Russian-speaking east and south of the country, i.e. the Novorossiya project. And we'll find out how that worked out. In the first days and weeks of the war, fighting was concentrated inside cities in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. On the 9th of May 2014, a group of armed separatists tried capturing the Mariupol police department. Police resisted, but were eventually overwhelmed by superior firepower, leaving six of them dead. The police station was burned down in the end. The separatists managed to get a shaky hold on the city for about a month, when on the 14th of June, the city was recaptured by Ukrainian forces. They were aided by right sector and Azov volunteers, both far-right ultra-nationalist groupings. The latter used armored vehicles created from dump trucks, using them as mobile firing positions against the separatists. Once the Ukrainian army blasted into the city, 
the six-hour operation began, in which Mariupol was effectively retaken and was made the temporary capital of the Donetsk region. This victory turned out to be crucial later on, since Mariupol is a strategically important city for multiple reasons. It has one of the biggest steel plants in Europe and blocks the way for a land bridge connecting Russia with Crimea. As the conflict dragged on, the Ukrainian army slowly reorganized itself into an at least workable military, which started showing results. The biggest factor here was the Ukrainian Air Force, which managed to inflict heavy losses on the separatists, who were at this point a bunch of loosely organized armed groups with no air defense. The separatist held areas were shrinking rapidly. It really looked like it's just a matter of time until the insurgency was over. Seeing this, Russia decided to supply the separatists with some heavy anti-air weapons to counter the Ukrainian Air Force. But then, something happened. On the 17th of July, 2014, separatists succeeded in shooting down a plane above Donbass using a SAM missile launcher. Do we remember Igor Girkin from earlier? Former FSB, Supreme Commander? Right after the plane went down, he made a post on Vekontakte, that's Russian Facebook, gloating about it. His post reads approximately as follows. We've just shot down an AN-26 in the Torres area. It fell somewhere around the Progress Mine. We've warned them already. Do not fly in our skies. Here's video proof of the bird's descent. The bird crashed past the mine's dump and didn't damage residential areas areas. No civilians were hurt. There is information about a second down plane, most likely Sukhoi. So that's pretty straightforward. Separatists managed to shoot down a military plane and now their leader is on social media gloating about it. However, upon inspecting the wreckage, they made a startling discovery. Ну что у вас там? Короче, блин, стопудово гражданский борт. Понятно. А этот как? Народу много там? Это пиздец. В обломке прямо во дворы падали тут. Вот так вот. Борт какой? Да я еще пока не разобрался, потому что я не был возле основной части. Я только вот смотрю там, где начали первые тела падать. Там остатки Понятно. внутренних кронштейнов, кресла, тела. Понятно. Вот так. И вооружение вот. есть что-нибудь? Вообще ничего. Гражданские вещи, медицинские ошметки, блин, там, бум, полотенце такое, туалетная бумага. Документы Гра... есть? Да. Индонезийского студента есть из университета Томпсона, блин. По самолету сбитым в районе Снежного Тереза. Ну? Это оказался пассажирский. Упал в районе Грабова, там море трупов, женщины, дети. Сейчас казаки там смотрят это все дело. По телевизору передают вроде бы как этот, Ан-26 украинский ну. транспортник. Но, говорят, написано на нем малазийские авиалинии. И что он делал на территории Украины? Ну, значит, довозили, завозили шпионов, не знаю. Понял. Не так хули так, сейчас война идет, блядь. On the 17th of July 2014, Malaysia Airlines MH17, flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur with 293 people on board, was shot down over the Donbass. There were no survivors. All non-Russian investigations came to the same conclusion. The plane was shot down by separatists by mistake using a book missile launcher belonging to the 53rd Air Defense Brigade of the Russian Army from near the city of Kursk. Bellingcat did a great investigation on this using open sources where they reconstructed the book's route based on photos and geolocation, including it being smuggled back to Russia on a trailer on the 18th of July. I highly recommend you read through the report, it's very interesting. Link in the description. To reiterate, separatists shot down a civilian plane over the Donbass with a Russian anti-air system, killing almost 300 civilians. And then both Russia and the separatists admitted their fault. And by that I mean they deny everything to this day, despite having been proven wrong beyond a shadow of a doubt. Okay, we need to talk about the Russian response to the downing of MH17 because, uh, Jesus Christ, let's just, let's just get into this. Let's consider this article together. Russian TV airs clearly fake image to claim Ukraine shot down MH17 by BuzzFeed News. On Friday, Russia's Channel 1 published what it said were satellite photos proving that a Ukrainian government fighter jet shot down Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 in July. Host Mikhail Leontyev, who is also a vice president of the state oil giant Rosneft, said that the pictures were sent to the Russian Union of Engineers by an MIT graduate named George Bilt. Leontyev quoted an email from Bilt in which he said that the plane, quote, was shot down with a classic jet fighter attack from the rear semi-sphere, end of quote. According to Russian propaganda at the time, MH17 was shot down by a Ukrainian Su-25. The article goes on, Russian bloggers, however, quickly took the claim to pieces. Photographer Rustem Adagamov found that part of the image came from the Google Images cache, dating back to August 2012. Journalist Sergei Parkomenko found several other pictures taken from Yandex.maps, a Russian site. Also, the fighter plane on the photo published by the Russians doesn't look like a Su-25. It looks more like a Su-27 or MiG-29. Here it is. This is the Su-25. Looks nothing like the plane on the 
picture. Also, the Boeing in the picture turned out to bear a suspicious resemblance to the first Russian language Google Images result for Boeing view from above. It had the Malaysia Airlines logo in the wrong place, which turned out to be the Boeing logo. The distance was wrong, the time was wrong, and the Russian unit of engineers turned out to not add up either. Ivan Andreevsky, the quote-unquote expert quoted in the show, does not appear to have an engineering education. A quick analysis of his PhD turned up obvious signs of plagiarism. And by the way, the Su-25 cannot even reach the altitude of passenger flights, its max altitude clocking in at about 7 kilometers. How did the Russians deal with this discrepancy? They doubled down on the claim, to the point where people from Moscow-based IP addresses edited the Su-25's maximum altitude on its Wikipedia page from 7 kilometers to 10. Now I went back and found the actual edit, it's still in the history. This is from Russian Wikipedia, by the way, I've translated the page in Chrome. According to sources, even the base model reaches 10,000 meters. This edit was made three days after the MH17 disaster. Right, so as we've discussed, this is a lie. And the sources linked there are either irrelevant or don't provide any data about past edits, so there's that. But wait, there's more. There was an update to the BuzzFeed article, which reads as follows. How could we check it? A Russian quote-unquote expert said when confronted with glaring mistakes in the image. It came to us from the internet. Update. The original source for the image told BuzzFeed News that he found it online and never expected to see it on Russian TV. Quote, those guys are either desperate or totally unprofessional. End of quote. So that's the Russian version of events, I suppose. Now you might be asking, what were they thinking? Whom were they trying to convince with these fake claims and Wikipedia edits? Well, that's just the thing. They weren't trying to convince you. They were trying to make you doubt everyone else. The images they published were complete bunk to every person even remotely familiar with image manipulation and military tech, but, well, most people aren't. Every undiscerning journalist publishing the images without thinking, every mindless share on social media, every person even talking about this really, helps generate more confusion, more informational white noise. In it, you're no longer sure what the truth is, meaning you're no longer sure whether the Russian narrative is false or not. This was the first large-scale instance of next-generation Russian information warfare, where the goal isn't to convince, but to sow the seeds of doubt. So about that Wikipedia edit where the Su-25's altitude was changed from 7 to 10 kilometers. Here Here's how RT uses that proven falsification to generate even more confusion. Peter Heisenker is a German pilot with a long service record. He became interested in the story of the downed Boeing after seeing a photograph taken at the crash site. Several days later, a Russian Ministry of Defense representative published data showing that not long before the tragedy, another aircraft had been observed in the vicinity of the Malaysian Boeing, reporting a Ukrainian jet in the sky. Man findet in Wikipedia, wenn man äh, die SU-25, das äh, Flugzeug, von dem äh, gesagt wird, dass es sich in der Nähe äh, dieser MH-017 befand, befunden haben soll, dann findet man plötzlich Einträge Dienstgipfelhöhe 7000 Meter. Einige Monate vorher war an derselben Stelle, sowohl in der englischen als auch in der deutschen Version, circa 10.000 Meter. Das ist verändert worden. Im Vorfeld dieses Absturzes. This is what next generation propaganda looks like. The past is alterable. The past never had been altered. The maximum altitude is 10 kilometers. The maximum altitude had always been 10 kilometers. And even if this narrative is proven wrong, that's just one more sound in the overwhelming informational white noise. In either case, Russia wins. It's both genius and absolutely terrifying, really. Outside of this bizarre parallel universe, there was another version about the tragedy by the Ukrainian security service about how the real target wasn't MH17, but a Russian plane to use as a council's belly for an invasion, but that claim was debunked by Bellingcat in the end. The real reason behind the downing of MH17 was simple incompetence by separatists, mistaking a civilian plane for a military one. Around the time of the MH17 disaster, the Ukrainian military started making serious progress during the so-called Great Raid of 2014. They beat back the separatists to the point where they managed to cut off Donetsk and Luhansk from each other. The enemy was weakened, demoralized, and retreating in most theaters. Victory was at hand. By mid-August, Ukrainian troops were inside Donetsk, advancing block by block. Under pressure from Russia, Igor Girkin resigned from the post of separatist commander. He was replaced by Alexander Zakarchenko. This represented the Russian government's change of strategy. Instead of insurgency and separatism, the name of the game became federalization, i.e. put pressure on the Ukrainian government through the conflict so they'll agree to federalize 
terrorize the country, which would result in Russia being able to maintain its influence over Ukraine. To this end, Russian troops and equipment started flowing into the Donbass through the uncontrolled checkpoints. The little green men were back, this time making an appearance in the east. Ukrainian troops caught 10 Russian paratroopers, in fact, who claimed they simply got lost around the border. The problem was, they were caught around the village of Zerkale, which is about 8 hours on foot from the Russian border. So either these professional soldiers trained in navigation couldn't orient themselves during 8 hours of marching, or Russia was deploying its troops inside Ukraine after the separatists started losing. This Reuters article goes on to say, Two witnesses told Reuters on Tuesday that the dozens of men who arrived at the weekend and set up a roadblock were not local and had military ration packs marked with Russian writing. While they bore no insignia, their appearance or behavior bore striking similarities to a group of Russian troops detained in Ukraine in the past few days and to Russian forces which occupied Crimea earlier this year, the witnesses said. So yeah, Russia started pushing troops and equipment across the border to prop up the separatists. An enormous counterattack followed, where Russian forces took large swaths of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Suddenly, the Ukrainian army found itself retreating. Following the Russian Blitzkrieg, a ceasefire was announced in the form of the so-called Minsk Agreement. This specified Ukrainian and separatist lines, set up a buffer zone between the two, and banned artillery above 100 mm. Despite this, most of the fighting continued. Also, separatists held an election on the 2nd of November in violation of the agreement. 331 people died during the ceasefire, which lasted more or less until January 2015. The following month, however, turned out to be the darkest, most brutal periods of the Donbass War. In the morning of the 25th of January, 2015, without warning, separatists fired on Mariupol with so-called GRAD multiple rocket launchers. If you ever wondered what that looks like from up close, here you go. The bombardment of Mariupol left 27 dead, the vast majority civilians, including two children. No wonder, the rockets were fired directly at a residential area. But what is Grad exactly? I'll let our friends over at Russia Today demonstrate. Grad missiles that were just fired at the Ukrainian army. Bellingcat later confirmed what everyone already suspected. The shelling was directed by Russian officers and militants. Based on their trajectory estimates, the rockets clearly came from separatist-controlled territories. I've linked their full report in the description, feel free to go over it. This, of course, was a war crime. And it wasn't the last. But parallel to the bombardment of Mariupol, there was another series of events unfolding. Following the Russian counterattack, Ukrainians still held the city of Debaltseve, driving a wedge between the two separatist territories. It was a strategically important road and railway crossing. Naturally, the Ukrainian defenses were significant. Separatists in loose formations had no realistic chance of taking the city. This brings us to Selfie Soldiers, an excellent documentary by Vice, linked in the description. The battle for the strategic town of Debaltseve in eastern Ukraine last February was a crucial turning point in the war between Ukrainian government forces and armed groups backed by Russia. Reports started surfacing that it was regular Russian army units that made the victory possible. Journalists recorded footage showing soldiers of non-European appearance who could not have come from Ukraine, operating heavy equipment and even playing soccer near Debaltseva, looking into the background of a fighter named Bato Dambayev, an ethnic Buryat from Siberia whose unit on the Mongolian border was said to have been sent to fight in Debaltseva in eastern Ukraine. Picture of himself in his uh, Russian army uniform. And here he is taking yet another selfie with a Russian flag patch on his arm. This was posted on the 20th of January. <laughs> This is the exact spot where an ethnic Asian looking soldier had his selfie taken in mid February. He then put that photograph up on a Russian social networking site. And that's why we know that he's a serving officer in the Russian Federation's army.
Despite mountains of evidence, Russia denies any involvement in the Ukrainian conflict, viewing it as a domestic Ukrainian matter, while at the same time threatening Ukraine with military action should they launch an offensive against the separatists. At the time of the Battle of the Boltseve, the Minsk ceasefire agreement had already collapsed after separatists launched an offensive to retake Donetsk airport. Then, on the 12th of February, Minsk II was enacted a renewed peace agreement calling for complete and unconditional ceasefire, among other things. It was agreed to by all sides, but then the separatists stated that it doesn't apply to the Baltave, so they launched the aforementioned offensive, pushing the Ukrainian military out of the city a week later. To Russia and its allies, agreements are just words on a paper at this point. After the Baltave, the ceasefire was observed, until separatists launched yet another offensive against the town of Mariinka involving tanks and artillery on the 3rd of June. Interestingly, this resulted in the first anti-war protest in Donetsk, where 500 people blocked a road in front of the administration building, calling for the fighting to stop. After the Mariinka offensive, fighting died down. The Donbass war became a frozen conflict, with only occasional skirmishes along the front lines. 2016 turned out to be a relatively peaceful year, during which only about 500 Ukrainian soldiers died. The ceasefire agreement agreement was holding until separatists launched an offensive on the city of Avdivka on the 29th of January 2017. Then, on the 18th of February, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov announced a new ceasefire agreement. Funny how Russia is always at the negotiating table for this domestic Ukrainian conflict that Russia has nothing to do with. But this ceasefire agreement was kind of observed in the end. The fighting never stopped, but its intensity was much lower. In 2020, only 50 Ukrainian soldiers died in battle, and in 2021, only 25. That's a 50% reduction in combat deaths in a democratic country's military fighting against the proxies of its larger neighbor engaged in a war of territorial conquest in 2021 Europe. But even during the war, life didn't stop in the rest of the country. The 2014 election saw pro-Ukrainian parties win in a landslide. As for the Ukrainian far-right, there were two such parties, Right Sector and Svoboda. The Right Sector won a single seat, while the Svoboda party lost 31 seats. Some people would count the Radical Party, the RPOL, as far-right, but they're more libertarian-leaning tradcons with a slight center-left bent. A pro-Russian party also ran in the elections, the so-called Opposition Bloc, a merger of six anti-Maidan parties, including former Party of Regions MPs, winning 27 seats. One of their leading politicians in parliament was Viktor Medvedchuk, local oligarch, notable for his daughter's godfather being Vladimir Putin. I'm not joking. Medvedchuk is considered an ally and close friend of Putin and has worked since 2014 to undermine Ukraine's pro-European course. He did this through his media empire, being the de facto owner of three major Ukrainian TV channels, 112 Ukraine, News One, and Zik, which were used to spread Russian narratives. This article goes into detail about how exactly this happened. Feel free to look it up. The 2014 presidential election was won by pro-European Petro Poroshenko by a wide margin. From that point on, Ukraine started its movement towards the EU. The law on decommunization was enacted, aiming to remove all Soviet monuments from public spaces, change Soviet-era names of public spaces, and ban all totalitarian symbols, including Soviet and Nazi ones. According to official statistics, more than 51,000 streets and about a thousand settlements were renamed, while 1,320 Lenin statues and 1,069 others were removed. Some people got creative, though. In Odessa, Lenin was turned into Darth Vader, so they won't have to bother with removal. The red stars were replaced by the Ukrainian trident, while statues and monuments were taken to museums, signaling the end of an era. Decentralization reform was enacted, not the kind Russia wanted, where Donetsk and Luhansk have a veto in foreign policy, but a process of strengthening local governance, giving local communities more sources of funding, and eliminating the top-heavy, over-centralized Soviet structure of government. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church, used as a geopolitical tool by Russia, was allowed to officially secede from the Moscow Patriarchate, negating Russian influence on churchgoers. Vitaly Klitschko, former Ukrainian boxing champion, became the mayor of Kiev. So, there's that. Ukraine received a visa waiver, meaning Ukrainians could now travel to the EU without having to get a visa. Due to reforms and improving governance, the economy grew despite the war. Poroshenko during his presidency requested NATO membership multiple times, but nobody in the alliance dared risking such a thing. I want you to consider this in light of recent developments, by the way. Corruption remained an issue, though, so in the 2019 presidential election, Poroshenko did not get a second term. A former actor and comedian, Volodymyr Zelensky, won the presidency in a landslide victory, campaigning on anti-corruption and putting an end to the Donbass war. 
before. With his candidacy, the traditional East-West divide disappeared. As an anti-corruption, pro-peace centrist, his appeal was universal, and this became a significant problem for the Russian propaganda machine. According to their narrative, Ukraine is ruled by a far-right Western puppet government that wants to eliminate Russian culture, but then Ukraine elects a Russian-speaking Jewish president in a landslide who runs on a platform of peace and reconciliation. On top of that, in the parliamentary elections a few months later, far-right parties won a single seat out of 450. Zelensky's party, servant of the people, also won in a landslide, gaining 254 seats. The second largest party became the pro-Russian opposition platform, with 43 seats chaired by the aforementioned Viktor Medvedchuk. Oopsie. With the election of Zelensky and his party, the pace of reforms accelerated significantly. The army reform and re-equipment initiated by Poroshenko was continued, resulting in a far more capable military with 405,000 active personnel and 250,000 in reserve. Their re-equipment has been underway for a while now, including with hardware from allies such as Humvees and Javelins. The latter was a pretty big deal, by the way. The reform's momentum also allowed for some unique developments. With Estonian assistance, the State in a Smartphone project was launched, so now, as a Ukrainian, you can handle most government bureaucracy through your smartphone instead of having to go to some office every time. Many cities created so-called annual public budgets, where people can propose small, local projects to implement, and then people can vote which projects should get financing. All in all, Ukraine is a country with huge potential. Much of their industry survives to this day, including rocketry, aviation, and military hardware. Moreover, 25% of all the black soil on the planet is located within the country, which is the most fertile type of soil that we know of. With land reform having been enacted in mid-2021, projections point to Ukraine becoming an agricultural superpower. It won't be that big of a leap, though, since they are already among the largest exporters. Otherwise, the image of decaying buildings and broken roads under a grey sky is slowly fading away. The road sector went through a complete reform in 2019, so by 2021 they've managed to repair 5,098 kilometers of roads in one year. And looking at some of these before-after pictures, well, I understand their motivation. In part with European and American financial assistance, a program for energy modernization is underway both for public and private buildings. This is both for the environment and for being less dependent on Russian gas. New norms for urban planning have been adopted, replacing outdated Soviet standards. The first pedestrianization projects are underway in Kiev, while cities like Lviv are already ahead of the curve. The rail sector is next in line for reforms. You thought I won't find a way to talk about trains, huh? Because turns out, Ukraine also has a large rolling stock manufacturing capacity. The first new domestically made passenger cars and diesel multiple units are already in passenger service, with more to come in the near future. The Kiev City Express project was launched, or I should say relaunched, which includes overhauling rolling stock and building new suburban rail lines. Also, following the crisis in Belarus, Stadler is now looking to move its factory to Ukraine. As you can see, things are mostly going in the right direction. Stuff is getting done, Ukrainian democracy, though very young, actually functions, there are working anti-corruption institutions, so all in all, there is a reason for hope. Russian President Vladimir Putin amassing troops and military hardware near Ukraine's borders and could launch an attack on the country at any time. Russia has for weeks been massing troops and tanks along the Ukrainian border. Russia's massive buildup of troops and firepower on Ukraine's doorstep. The first of thousands of U.S. troops have now arrived in Poland and Germany to support NATO amid, amid fears of a Russian invasion of Ukraine.